and changed the glory of the incorruptible God to an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Instead of glorifying God, what do they do? They make a statue. They cut it out of a tree. They use part of the tree for making coffee, you know, heat it up and they make coffee over it. And they take some of the, the wood chips and maybe they pull them around a tree and make mulch. And with this, what is left this thing they carved out, they stand down in front of it, they bow down to it, and they say, you are my God. And I see people do it all the time. Statues of Buddha in their home. Uh, they go and rub the pig's nose at a restaurant, or they uh, you know, go to a, a Buddha belly, and they rub the belly. And all of these things are uh, uh, looking for luck, looking for prosperity, looking for something that does not come from God. They're saying, this piece of brass can give me uh, reconciliation with the infinite creator, or I can bow down to this piece of wood and not be held accountable for it. And yet God says that we are accountable. We make these things, four-footed creatures and uh, uh, representations of man, etc., and because of it, we are utterly condemned. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Here they're doing these perverted things, and what does it naturally do? It leads from a rejection of God to speaking to stone. It leads to immorality and perversion. God gives them up, and the next thing they do is they use their own bodies as vehicles of disobedience. They get into immoral, immoral perversions. Uh, it doesn't matter what type it is, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's um, you know sleeping with lots of different women or premarital sex or anything like that. All of these things are a result of us getting further and further away from God, suppressing the knowledge of truth in our own unrighteousness, and then going and making idols, praying to them, and the next thing you know, we start saying, well, uh, it, here's an example, the Asherim, which is a, a type of uh, idol in the, uh, um, in the Bible. Asherim were these large phallic symbols. Well, what were they doing? They said, we need fertility to come out of the land. So they make a uh, statue of a for fertility goddess, and then they go rub their bodies on it, and next thing you know, they're thinking, not only is it gonna help with the land, it's gonna make me fertile. I know because I've been in Japan and they have this every year, they drag this big phallic symbol through the streets and women that can't get pregnant go and ride on this phallic symbol and they think that it's gonna make them pregnant. That's not what's gonna do it. It's God that gives life in the womb. It has nothing to do with a piece of stone and looking forward to getting a, a, a child because you've rubbed yourself on a thing that looks like a human penis. It's just, this is what Paul is talking about. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creator rather the, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever amen and here's what we're doing we are worshiping the creature rather than the creator where uh, you know we got the tree we carve it up we do that or we may worship women some people worship sex as a, uh, a false idol they may worship their uh, you know their spouse or they may worship a, a, a sports figure or anything other than that but they will worship anything except the Creator and that is where we get led astray you can see how he's following this progression of, of suppressing the knowledge of truth of God and then starting to worship idols and then using our bodies for disobedience and finding Finally, we are worshiping the creature rather than the creator, and we're putting all our hope in flesh rather than in God. And God throughout the Bible condemns that as wickedness and as a way of being utterly and completely separated from an infinitely holy God. So we'll stop there today. Uh, let me see, we were on verse, um, we just finished up verse 25, Romans 1, 25. And so the next capital I go to, I'll start on verse 26 and we'll go from there. But before I leave, I'd like to say a quick prayer for the people of South Dakota. There have been a few out here, but it's, you know, it's uh, not in session right now, and there are not a lot of people around. I did meet a great group of people that were traveling, evangelists uh, that were, uh, you know, in the uh, capital, and uh, they were uh, uh, going out to some fair or something to evangelize, but they were taking a capital tour when I did. So anyway, it's been a nice day, and I hope that you've uh, learned something from the Book of Romans, and uh, let's go ahead and say a prayer for South Dakota. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for bringing me to South Dakota. What a lovely state. I am just absolutely blessed to be here. And uh, the cool air, the blue sky, the sun that's shining, and uh, just every good thing from your open hand. And I ask that you turn and you bless these people. They have been so kind to me in every store I've gone into or every place I've been. 
just wonderful people. Take good care of them. Any that don't know you, may they come somehow to a knowledge of you and to praise you. And those that are weak in their faith, strengthen them. And those that are strong in their faith, give them the desire and the urge to just go out and tell everybody about your goodness and your glory. And may we never exchange the truth of you for anything other than you yourself that we should only praise you and worship you through the person of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this I pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.